Uh, good morning. Uh, we can start, I guess. Thanks a lot for coming over uh, to listen to the presentation we have prepared for you. I hope it will be somewhat interesting. Um, so my name is uh, Anatoly Peshkov. I represent a company, DSR Corporation. So uh, the main uh, topic of that presentation, there are a lot of technical details, but besides technical details, we would like to talk about a use case, some use case, and uh, some challenges on um, introducing new type of uh, security or the way how we handle identity in IoT. So first, a little bit about DSR, so you will get an idea why uh, we are talking about that subject. So DSR is a software company. Uh, we actually do a lot of work uh, for different companies in the industry, uh, different industries, specifically in IoT, quite a bit. Uh, so DSR is a part of Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, and um, uh, besides that, um, we are part of CSA. If you don't know what is CSA, CSA it's a um, communication standard alliance, connectivity standard alliance. Uh, you, you can find that information csa-iot.org. So this is a pretty big organization. Uh, contains about like I don't remember 350 companies. So main mainly it's drivers in IoT industry. Uh, the big names I can just call out like uh, Amazon, Google, Apple, and uh, Legrand, other big companies who are uh, Bosch, uh, who are playing a uh, huge um, role in IoT industry. So DSR is a very active uh, member of uh, CSA. So we are working on um, uh, standards, defining standards. We have been at CSA for over 10 years. Uh, just as a kind of like a reference, uh, CSA, it's a former Zigbee Alliance. So it will maybe give you more background uh, on what's going on here. So company itself, DSR is not huge. Again, it's a software company. We have uh, almost like uh, 300 engineers. Uh, we have been around for 25 years, uh, working with small companies and large corporations, Fortune 500 and Global 2000. Um, and um, mainly uh, three um, markets, uh, three regions, I would say. So North America, Europe, and uh, Japan. So these are like uh, three focuses for uh, DSR. Yes, and headquarters in Colorado, Denver, uh, who came a little bit earlier. You saw the picture of a beautiful lake uh, that is in Colorado, very nice one. This is a short information. The company was founded in 1998. Um, so we have several divisions, um, like uh, we have a pretty large IoT division. And uh, we have a business unit uh, which is working in um, decentralized systems. Um, so these are have, uh, have been a um, um, contributor for India, Eris, and Ditcom. You can see our names uh, there, and we have been working with several companies in the industry very closely as a partner. So what we will talk about, and again, uh, the main point we will uh, at the end discuss uh, use case uh, and the challenges uh, introducing SSI uh, for IoT. But um, before we will touch that specific topic, I will just go over some uh, challenges in IoT industry overall. Uh, regarding security. So security in IoT, uh, the ones who are uh, uh, actually working in IoT, uh, you understand what's the main uh, base for security in IoT, or what kind of challenges. So there are some issues uh, regarding con confidentiality. Uh, it's, it's very essential issue. And um, so the way how to solve it, uh, there were several uh, governing laws introduced, uh, JDPR, you know, and um, SB, California SB 327. Uh, by the way, that California SB 327 was specifically addressed to IoT uh, security issues. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of companies uh, and standards, uh, they had to adjust uh, the approach in security. Uh, that's actually brought us to new standards. It means as soon as new standard is introduced, uh, there is a new uh, 
um, implementation has to come in place, uh, certification, and then release of the devices or solutions uh, on the market. Uh, this is a little uh, brief about uh, G GDPR, uh, what kind of requirements uh, it uh, introduces, and um, California Consumer Privacy Act. The, these are two main drivers uh, in last, I would say, three, four years uh, for IoT, uh, for security, I mean. So let's talk about a little bit about digital identity. Digital identity, um, overall, we, we all understand what does it mean uh, for people. Uh, it means, uh, yes, we, have, we can have our traditional identity, like passport or ID and so on. However, uh, the new identity we are getting uh, in place, it's uh, related to digital identity. And, um, but it's, it's very interesting that uh, we are as humans, yes, we have to have an identity, but in the same time, if you think about, um, let's say, a device. Device, it's a proxy for us as humans, and they, they have devices, they have a lot of data. It means uh, there is a right away, the issue is around privacy, uh, how the data is um, stored, uh, who has access to the data, um, and it means every device uh, has to have an identity. If you think about how many devices uh, right now deployed on the market, uh, on the planet, it's a huge number, really huge, like a wireless communication, like sensors. Uh, like in, even in, in this room, if you'll start counting, I, I'm sure we'll, we can count like about 200 devices, at least, including, of course, your cell phones, your laptops, uh, different kind of motion, motion sensors, um, video cameras, uh, smoke alarm devices, and so on and so forth. And all these devices, they have to have an identity. So, uh, and again, uh, we are talking about um, challenges for digital identity. The main is the trust and privacy. Um, uh, there are some standards already in place, uh, but we need to really improve it and uh, work on it. Um, so, Let's uh, check what kind of uh, identity models are available on the market. Uh, at first, a very traditional siloed identity. It's a, you know, SSL uh, base, uh, TLS SSL, SSL. This is, uh, you can see it, case number one. So when you send um, some information, confirmation, and it's directly confirmed by, by organization. So then there is a second uh, type of um, uh, identity confirmation. It's a third party, and uh, we all can see it's in place, in play when, we, when um, for instance, like you are uh, trying to register yourself on some uh, website, it's offering you like face, face, using Facebook identity or your Google identity. So this is all, and again, all the information is stored in those uh, pro, uh, storages of those providers. Of course, there is a deficiency here because we cannot control our identity. Now it's all controlled by um, third parties. And it's not necessarily evil, by the way, uh, because it's just a convenience for right now. So, but we need to evolve those methods. And a very uh, important uh, protocol, uh, X.509, uh, it's in place heavily used in uh, IoT. Uh, a lot of money is already invested into uh, support for uh, that protocol in IoT. A lot of companies, they spend uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, for the infrastructure. And we will talk a little bit later about uh, what does it mean. But uh, if you think about overall, uh, it's great. There is some infrastructure in place. However, this is a huge obstacle for moving forward with uh, new methods uh, for introducing new security and identity methods on the market. Why? Because um, a lot of money is already in place, uh, in, uh, invested, and uh, when you are making new decision, like moving to a new uh, method, then it means all this money will go to nowhere. And it means every person who made a decision uh, to invest into this kind of infrastructure will be I would not say exactly personally uh, responsible. However, it's a career-related uh, uh, decision. So 
So it means we are having more interesting obstacles to, um, for implementation of new methods. Uh, so the new method is uh, SSI, uh, self-sovereign identity. Uh, most of you are quite familiar with that. This is a new method uh, which we are trying to introduce in IoT. But uh, in order to introduce it, uh, we need to have main players being at first interested in new methods. Uh, there should be a reason why it should be introduced. And uh, secondly, we need to get those companies on board so they will start pushing a new approach um, on the market. And that's quite a task. Now, let's talk about IoT in general, um, specifics of the um, security in IoT. So, yes, uh, there are several specifics. Uh, however, uh, th the main ones, of course, we need to make uh, communication secure, that's pretty clear, uh, very simple, uh, but um, if you will think about IoT, there is a lot of um, wireless communication involved here and uh, a lot of embedded devices and this is a completely different world and usually like developers, like uh, I don't know, people who are working like on hyperledger, blo blockchain and so on, they don't understand that exactly, uh, why? Because well, here's a computer, you just design the code, and who cares how much you know, memory it takes, how much uh, resources, uh, CPU, and so on. Actually, people, of course, care. I'm simplifying it. However, not the way how embedded uh, software engineers care, because here is every byte, every cycle CPU should be counted, and uh, every system should be strictly budgeted. So. In that case, uh, we have a, quite a challenge. It means uh, all the methods we are talking about, they have to be implemented strictly and focused towards um, um, embedded devices. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, 509. And again, I, I don't want to kind of like um, go over in details because this is all public information. You can, uh, there is no innovation here we are talking about. I just want to make a reference uh, what exactly happening. And um, so uh, 509 been, been, uh, have been um, quite a traditional approach in IoT for digital identity for devices. And it's uh, really, um, there were a lot of efforts to make uh, 509 working. Uh, for IoT devices, some are okay for some ecosystems, some are really not very successful. If you uh, think like latest uh, protocols uh, coming to the market uh, about IoT, uh, if you're familiar, there is a new protocol, Matter, uh, which will be released uh, in December. Uh, that's a new protocol um, for uh, IP-based uh, devices, uh, based on, like it can be based on like Ethernet, or it can be based on um, Thread. If you know Thread, it's a wireless communication protocol, uh, kind of like a successor to six low pen. Uh, so 509 is really kind of a real base for these protocols. However, uh, that classic approach doesn't uh, allow us to move forward. There are some drawbacks and uh, deficiencies in this protocol. Uh, for instance, uh, as I talked about like footprint, footprint of devices, it's, it's really a big deal. Why? Because uh, when you are releasing a device, like, I don't know, let's say motion sensor, uh, that device can be released like 100 million devices uh, as a, as I'm, just, I'm just talking about scale. It means when you are uh, adding more memory, the price is going up, and overall the cost of that investment and uh, uh, solution is, is, is huge. So 509 uh, has a, uh, like a, a lot of uh, deficiency here. Why? Because the key itself is very long, and uh, uh, storing it on a device uh, can be too expensive. This is the way um, how it works um, usually. So we are consider, uh, talking about here two uh, personas, um, Alice and Bob. Um, so 
and all the verification is going through um, a root um, authority of the root pu public certificate. Uh, by the way, just for reference, I, I'm not exactly a, a specialist in uh, security, uh, so I can answer some questions, uh, but not all of them. So I'm just representing the topic, but I know a little bit more about IoT. So uh, what's happening here, uh, you can see, so it's always involved root, and it's, it's kind of a very critical point because it brings, um, if root will be compromised, uh, so if the implementation is not really strong, it means all the certificates for all the devices will be comp compromised and the entire system, that's a huge security breach. So it means uh, that approach, it still works, but in this case we will have an issue. Uh, and uh, 509 doesn't give us a lot of privacy. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, because when we are sending all the information to uh, verifier, we are basically sending all the information about device. And that's not good, good actually, because um, you, you understand like there is some information not related to uh, verification process at all. Uh, I, I can give you like a real example uh, of life. Uh, so I live in Colorado, and, uh, but there are different states, the way how they handle like uh, your access to um, alcohol, for instance, in the bar. So you know how it's happening. Uh, the waiter or waitress, they check your ID. Uh, and they check ID, they can see your um, data base, so they know exactly how old are you. And they can check, for instance, in some cases, social security number. There is some additional information which is not exactly related to the case because what waiter should be worried about, I'm over 21, right? But in some states, I don't want to name it, but in some states, it's even worse. They take your ID, they go into some room and send in that information to the state government. And that's, uh, this is the uh, kind of demonstration how, and that your information is leaked to some third party and you have no control on this. So SSI uh, idea, so to make uh, privacy confidentiality working more granularly. So that's, that's the idea. So that's, I was talking actually about already that case. So there are several more issues here related to 509. I don't want to like talk more because there are uh, definitely that solution has to be improved. And uh, this is why uh, we believe that SSI approach uh, will uh, give us a chance to improve it dramatically. So there are several issues, as I said, uh, non selective disclosure, uh, no authorization. And besides that, I talked about overhead. Uh, and single uh, point of failure, so again. So let's talk about uh, what SSI so, uh, self-sovereign identity uh, provides us and what kind of advantage will give us so we can improve uh, security for devices. Not only for uh, people, but overall for devices as well. Uh, we believe that um, uh, SSI approach uh, will help to uh, create more robust and more um, reliable security uh, and help us to control our identity of devices, which is very important. And this is the way how it works. It's slightly different than uh, in case of 509, um, but um, well, there are some actually similarities. There is an article, very nice one, uh, if, if you want to check uh, the difference between 509 and SSI. Uh, I can give you a reference uh, to that article that explains like very much in details what is the essential difference. So what um, SSI provides? Uh, SSI provides um, security, of course, uh, private privacy and uh, verifiable relationship. So verifiable credentials, um, we all know 
yes, there are some already examples of digital passports, uh, device certificates, access tokens, and uh, bank accounts. So we are talking about what are the key terms for SSI. I'm just giving you time to read. I, I can read it for you. This is the way how the um, SSI verifiable credentials uh, work. It's a workflow. Uh, on the left side, you can see issuer. Uh, issuer uh, issuing a credential, which goes to um, holder. Uh, and holder, in our case, device uh, or a person, uh, stores the data on their, in their memory or on their device. And there is a verifier, uh, verifier and uh, then there is a decentralized uh, network. It can be blockchain uh, for uh, creating, uh, storing some public information. By the way, uh, it's not exactly, uh, it's, it can be not a blockchain at all. It can be, some of the solutions can be used without blockchain. So it's not necessarily like blockchain is involved. Blockchain just helps um, to uh, store that information publicly and being decentralized. Okay, uh, well, that's, um, uh, that slide uh, showing like a um, magic <laughs> of SSI. Of course, there are a lot of technical details here, uh, very important ones, which dis distinguishes a new approach against uh, the previous ones. But this is kind of like overall um, a dream, I would say. So privacy, again, uh, talking about privacy, it's a big deal. Uh, and uh, uh, SSI approach completely provides uh, a mechanism so the way how our privacy and device privacy can be uh, preserved. So here we have several uh, actors, I would say, uh, Alice and Bob, and uh, the way uh, how Alex uh, deals with uh, Share information uh, and presents it to Bob about banks and hospitals and um, police. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So th that is the case. Uh, we have a demo. Uh, I will I will show you a little uh, video. Actually, uh, it's an actual IoT demo uh, of the implementation, uh, the way how SSI could work for IoT. Well. Uh, you, you probably know there are several companies trying to implement SSI already for IoT, but again, there are a lot of obstacles here. And like real good implementation, I mean, true implementation, as we know, doesn't exist yet. Because it, we still need to work on uh, a lot of technology side details. Uh, repeatability, that's one of the... Um, issues here, and um, 509, for, for instance, uh, always non-reputable. Uh, so here we have a case and SSI uh, completely solves it. And it's very important that uh, SSI uh, helps us to uh, provide not all the information, which provide the only information which is required for specific case. Uh, and uh, um, 509, in this case, of course, will disclose everything which is not even related to the case. Uh, there is an uh, anonymous revocation mechanism. Uh, that's very important as well, part of the deal. And um, this is the way how the authorization is happening. By the way, that presentation uh, is, will be available as a part of all materials for the conference. And um, so you can check it. Of course, you can ask questions and uh, send me personally uh, questions, happy to answer. So SSI uh, actually provides a delegation for authority. This is a kind of like a regular case. Uh, if you think about, I know, I have a question for you. Who has like home automation at home, like system? How many? Like, I don't know, garage or a door or you have it. Okay, S several people. And, and you know, uh, like if you are going for vacation, sometimes like 
it depends on what kind of neighbors you have. Like I have a very nice neighbor and uh, I like him to like open my garage and uh, you know, like swing the package I received uh, uh, to uh, under the garage door. And it's, but uh, you know, some of the systems now, they like on the application level allow in doing it. Like for instance, I can delegate some of the rights. But SSI actually helps uh, in delegation quite a bit. It provides additional mechanism and security. For instance, you can say, okay, that person can access my home like five to six in the morning or I don't know, during uh, uh, like two to 3 p.m. Uh, to fix uh, some electrical issues and so on. Uh, most important, um, zero knowledge IoT clouds. Uh, that is a big deal, why? Because um, every IoT system stores a lot of data about us. Like uh, when you come in home, when you are leaving home, what is the temperature, how you are using electricity, and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, but uh, SSI helps us to make all this data basically not personalized. So it means if, even if you will have an access to the data, it will be difficult to connect to a specific person. That's very important. So it's a zero knowledge IoT clouds. Here we are talking about uh, distributed source of trust. So there is no single point of failure, which is important. It means if uh, the network will be compromised, it will be only kind of on a very, very much localized. And you can see one of the several approaches how it can be done. This is kind of more technical. Um, so talking about uh, compact evocation. So it can be done in a very efficient way. Uh, again, uh, we are very much up to uh, using SSI against uh, 509. So we would like to push it. And uh, by the way, if you are interested in uh, exploring that approach, uh, please talk to us. Um, happy to uh, find partners and uh, people who really, or organizations who really like to uh, have it um, deployed on the market. Uh, now, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, Hyperledger uh, Indy and Ares. Uh, why? Because our company was one of the maintainers and contributors uh, to Indy and uh, to uh, Ares. So overall, um, this is very generic information and you, must, uh, you might know that. So uh, Indy, it's an independent identity, basically. Uh, this is uh, an uh, open source um, software, which uh, is, it's an active uh, project, uh, which is part of Hyperledger and Linux Foundation. Uh, everyone can access it and uh, download and contribute and so on. This is a state right now, it's uh, Indy uh, uh, to the moment. Uh, there are several uh, components which are written in Rust, uh, Python, Node.js, Java, .NET. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting, like, uh, can you use one of those components like for IoT? It's not applicable. Like, yes, you can use it like on a gateway, which is pretty powerful device, can be, but on an actual, like a very much restricted device, that's not possible. So it means we have to create additional software which will target um, a specific range of devices. And you know, the challenges we are talking about are substantial. Uh, let's talk about like what kind of devices we are dealing. Let's say there is a um, gateway. gateway it can be like Linux or FreeRTOS or I know, Zephyr, whatever it is, the operating system. Uh, and there, is a, a lot, there are a lot of resources uh, to handle um, SSI. However, if you will move uh, like to sensors, in that case you will have a, a challenge. Why? Because the devices are very much, very much restricted, not only on a, like a RAM size or a ROM size. Uh, they are restricted on amount of energy because if you will move like one step up or depends on down, 
Uh, let's, let's talk about green power devices. Uh, if you are familiar with green power devices, these are really super restrictive uh, uh, devices. For instance, like when you are using, you can be using switch, uh, which is a, can be battery less switch. It means what's happening, uh, light switch, you are pushing the button and there is some mechanism which generates enough memory, uh, enough energy uh, for CPU to process like a certain very small amount of operations. And uh, all the security certification, uh, verification and so on should be able to fit into uh, and usage of that uh, amount of uh, memory. So we are, we, it's a pretty challenging task and make it secure. We need to understand how far we want to go with that uh, security approach. Well, um, some of you know um, Eris. Um, so Eris, it's, I would say, like a, not exactly a new generation of Indy. It's a more decoupled uh, architecture than uh, Indy itself. Uh, so DSR has been working uh, on Eris as well. Uh, but besides, I, I want to tell you that uh, DSR uh, itself, we have been working on Fabric and Ethereum, so we have been using a lot of uh, components uh, in our development it depends on customers and so on. Here I, uh, we are talking specifically about Indian areas because the demo is based on India. Okay, uh, so what is the difference between Indian well, there are, and areas? There are a lot of differences, but it's more like components. Uh, so it's more decoupled and uh, uh, less, I would say, not solid, I would say it. Uh, more flexible architecture than India. Um, and again, uh, the demo I'm going to show you, uh, it's based on India, but uh, here we have a comparison between India and Eris, so you can see uh, the difference. Uh, let's talk about IoT use cases uh, for SSI. Um, Okay, the main challenge for uh, in IoT, uh, when the, most of the security breaches is happening, this is the moment when we are commissioning device. Because when you are commissioning device, it means uh, that device has to provide like uh, security authentication to appear where it's connecting to the network. So making sure if the device will be included into the network, it has to be secure. It's, like, it's not a device which is not authorized, should not be connected. And th that moment actually is a very important moment because most of the breaches, uh, if you will see uh, happening uh, on the market, it's at the moment when the commissioning of the device is happening. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you uh, try to connect, I don't know, let's say homecoming feature of your car, like opening the garage door. Uh, actually, I had an incident then I was commissioning the device, and at the same time, my neighbor opened the garage, and my device got connected to his garage. That's, that's really unacceptable. So it means that moment is a very, I'll say, intimate and very important one. So uh, addressing the device authentication, uh, it's a very critical uh, step. And uh, this is the way um, how the SSI can help uh, solving that. So this is a continue of uh, device authentication. There are some little details here. Of course, uh, in real life, uh, if we would implement it as a part of the standard, there are more details has to be worked out. And uh, a lot of, uh, of course, review and security site, excuse me, uh, have to be done. Uh, well, now we are talking about the smart, uh, the, the, uh, the use case itself. So the idea is, um, so Alice, uh, she wants to delegate uh, access to her smart lock to the neighbor. This is a delegation basically and uh, to Bob. And this is the way how it uh, uh, can be done for, uh, using SSI. Okay. And here's the case uh, how the revocation uh, could happen. 
in this case. And uh, this use case, it's number three, uh, showing how to preserve um, uh, privacy, not sharing a lot of information uh, about pr private information with uh, third party. So basically, Alice, uh, she wants to access a door, um, and she has to be over 18 years old. Uh, let's, let's talk about, like, she wants to access a bar, and she wants to get in, so she just using her credential, and in that case, the credential will send a message, uh, confirmation that she's over 18, but it, it will not specify how old is she. So that is really very important. So there are several more additional use cases uh, we have kind of um, uh, listed here. Uh, you can see, but of course, uh, the number of use cases is huge uh, in IoT. And uh, if you are using at home uh, IoT devices, you need to think about your privacy quite a bit. Uh, there is a, by the way, uh, alliance, uh, IOXT alliance in the United States. Uh, that uh, IOXT alliance is working all about security. And one of the members actually did a check at his house, very interesting. Uh, he has uh, many devices and uh, he checked uh, how much traffic is going out of his house. And he found out that the amount of traffic was huge, really. So yes, there is traffic incoming that's initiated by him, but the amount of traffic generated by some Wi-Fi router was so huge, he actually had to turn it off because uh, he didn't know what kind of information was translated to the net. So it means security is really a big deal. Uh, and especially, um, so, pr so you need to uh, be in control of your security. Uh, this is a demo. By the way, demo is available uh, on the uh, internet. Um, you, you can download the uh, presentation and there is a link to YouTube video. Um, I, will, uh, run, I will try to run that video here. Just a second. It's a very short one, basically a couple of minutes. Okay, here we are. This is a demo showcasing a blockchain IoT security use case using the Zigbee IoT stack. This process is widely applicable to security and hospitality applications and increases the efficiency and security of access control while also maintaining the total privacy of the user or guest. So let's walk through the process and a simple use case. First, we have to start with credentials. Credentials are initially created by an authority, such as the government. The credential in this example consists of basic information, such as a name and birth date. Think of it as a license or passport. Upon issuance, this credential is signed by the authority using a key that is rooted on the blockchain. This allows us to use the blockchain as a source of trust later on for storing public information, such as the issuer's public keys. Here you can see the initial credentials issuance process. Notice how fast and simple it is to create a new set of credentials and to create a secure connection between devices using a simple barcode. Then, in order to gain access to something, in this case, our hotel minibar, the prover connects to the gateway or verifier via a public key. The gateway then requests a proof from the prover who sends back a zero knowledge proof. For instance, the proof verifies that the person is old enough to access the minibar, but does not tell you their age. Here you can see the whole system. The small white box is the gateway. The black box is the lock we will be operating and an indicator light bulb is on the left. First, we create a connection between the prover and verifier. The prover gets a public key from the gateway and fulfills the proof request from the verifier. You can now see from our indicator light that the user's proof has been verified and the box will unlock. In a situation such as our minibar example, it is likely that we would want to grant repeat access to the user. 
You can see here that the user can use their existing credential to unlock the MIDI bar without repeating the issuance process, just as you would with a real-world ID or passport. If the credential doesn't match the proof request, in this case, if the user is too young, the app will generate no proof and the user will simply see an error message. It is important to remember that the zero-knowledge proof is not the same as the user's credential, and it does not disclose all of the information about the prover, but only the required information. In this case, it's sufficient to prove that the user is old enough to access the minibar, but their exact age, name, and birthday will not be disclosed. This system allows for access control without interface between the prover and authority. The zero-knowledge proof can be verified by the verifier, in this case the minibar, via the blockchain without direct communication with the issuer. The issuer or authority can even be offline and the verification will still work. This way, the user can be granted secure access without ever disclosing any of their private information. Visit our website today and let us know how DSR can help you come up with a solution for your product or company. Thank you. Um. Uh, just for your reference, uh, the, uh, what kind of tools you used here? You can see like two iPhones, um, and uh, there is a, a gateway. Uh, the gateway itself is on Ras Raspberry Pi, uh, so it means we had to implement uh, SSI on a Raspberry Pi, and uh, we did a, uh, some of the implementation is done on a, a, a door lock itself. It's a Zigbee door lock, um, so that's the, uh, we, we are using Zigbee protocol for. Uh, this demo. Okay, well, let's. Um, that's all, actually. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, well, that's a link. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah, no, no worries. It's all good. <laughs> Teamwork. So that's a link. Uh, you can get that link uh, uh, from the presentation. Um, well, we have, sorry, like two minutes left <laughs> for questions, but you can ask me questions uh, after um, the presentation itself. So again, my name is Anatoly Peshkov. I'm a CEO and founder for DSR Corporation, a company out of Colorado, Denver. Please talk to me if you have questions or ideas. Okay, thank you. <laughs>